This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading is by Michael Sirois, michael.sirois, dot com. Penguin Island by Anatole France. Book 7. Modern Times. Madame Saray. Book 7. Chapter 8. Further Consequences. The session ended calmly, and the ministry saw no dangerous signs upon the benches where the majority sat. It was visible, however, from certain articles in the moderate journals, that the demands of the Jewish and Christian financiers were increasing daily, that the patriotism of the banks required a civilizing expedition to Negritia, and that the steel trusts, eager in the defense of our coasts and colonies, were crying out for armored cruisers and still more armored cruisers. Rumors of war began to be heard. Such rumors sprang up every year as regularly as the trade winds, serious people paid no heed to them, and the government usually let them die away from their own weakness, unless they grew stronger and spread, for in that case the country would be alarmed. The financiers only wanted colonial wars, and the people did not want any wars at all. It loved to see its government proud and even insolent, but at the least suspicion that a European war was brewing, its violent emotion would quickly have reached the house. Paul Visere was not uneasy. The European situation was, in his view, completely reassuring. He was only irritated by the maniacal silence of his Minister of Foreign Affairs. That gnome went to the cabinet meetings with a portfolio bigger than himself, stuffed full of papers, said nothing, refused to answer all questions, even those asked by the respected President of the Republic, and exhausted by his obstinate labors, took a few moments' sleep in his armchair, in which nothing but the top of his little black head was to be seen above the green tablecloth. In the meantime, Hippolyte Serret became a strong man again. In company with his colleague La Personne, he formed numerous intimacies with ladies of the theatre. They were both to be seen at night, entering fashionable restaurants in the company of ladies, whom they overtopped by their lofty stature and their new hats, and they were soon reckoned among the most sympathetic frequenters of the boulevards. Fortune La Personne had his own wound beneath his armor. His wife, a young milliner whom he carried off from a marquis, had gone to live with a chauffeur. He loved her still and could not console himself for her loss, so that very often, in the private room of a restaurant, in the midst of a group of girls who laughed and ate crayfish, the two ministers exchanged a look full of their common sorrow and wiped away an unbidden tear. Hippolytus Serret, although wounded to the heart, did not allow himself to be beaten. He swore that he would be avenged. Madame Paul Visere, whose deplorable health forced her to live with her relatives in a distant province, received an anonymous letter specifying that Monsieur Paul Visere, who had not a half-penny when he married her, was spending her dowry on a married woman, E. C that he gave this woman thirty thousand franc motor cars and pearl necklaces costing twenty five thousand francs and that he was going straight to dishonor and ruin madame paul visere read the letter fell into hysterics and handed it to her father i am going to box your husband's ears said m blampignon he is a blackguard who will land you both in the workhouse unless we look out he may be prime minister but he won't frighten me when he stepped off the train, M. Blampignon presented himself at the Ministry of the Interior, and was immediately received. He entered the Prime Minister's room in a fury. "'I have something to say to you, sir,' and he waved the anonymous letter. Paul Visere welcomed him, smiling. "'You are welcome, my dear father. I was going to write to you. Yes, to tell you of your nomination to the rank of officer of the Legion of Honor. I signed the patent this morning. M. Blampignon thanked his son-in-law warmly and threw the anonymous letter into the fire. He returned to his provincial house and found his daughter fretting and agitated. "'Well, I saw your husband. He is a delightful fellow. But then you don't understand how to deal with him.' About this time Hippolyte Serret learned through a little scandalous newspaper, it is always through the newspapers that ministers are informed of the affairs of state, that the prime minister dined every evening with mademoiselle lisiane of the folie dramatique whose charm seemed to have made a great impression on him thenceforth serret took a gloomy joy in watching his wife 
She came in every evening to dine or dress with an air of agreeable fatigue and the serenity that comes from enjoyment. Thinking that she knew nothing, he sent her anonymous communications. She read them at the table before him and remained still listless and smiling. He then persuaded himself that she gave no heed to these vague reports and that in order to disturb her it would be necessary to enable her to verify her lover's infidelity and treason for herself. There were at the ministry a number of trustworthy agents charged with secret inquiries regarding the national defence. They were then employed in watching the spies of a neighbouring and hostile power who had succeeded in entering the postal and telegraphic service. M. Serret ordered them to suspend their work for the present and to inquire where, when, and how the Minister of the Interior saw Mademoiselle Lision. The agents performed their missions faithfully and told the minister that they had several times seen the prime minister with a woman, but that she was not Mademoiselle Lision. Hippolyte Serret asked them nothing further. He was right. The loves of Paul Visere and Lision were but an alibi invented by Paul Visere himself with Eveline's approval, for his fame was rather inconvenient to her, and she sighed for secrecy and mystery. They were not shadowed by the agents of the Ministry of Commerce alone. They were also followed by those of the Prefect of Police, and even those of the Minister of the Interior, who disputed with each other the honor of protecting their chief. Then there were the emissaries of several royalist, imperialist, and clerical organizations, those of eight or ten blackmailers, several amateur detectives, a multitude of reporters, and a crowd of photographers, who all made their appearance wherever these two took refuge in their perambulating love affairs. At big hotels, small hotels, townhouses, country houses, private apartments, vias, museums, palaces, and hovels. They kept watch in the streets, from neighboring houses, trees, walls, staircases, landings, roofs, adjoining rooms, and even chimneys. The minister and his friend saw with alarm, all round their bedroom, gimlets boring through doors and shutters, and drills making holes in the walls. A photograph of Madame Serret, in night attire, buttoning her boots, was the most that had been obtained. Paul Visere grew impatient and irritable, and often lost his good humor and agreeableness. He came to the cabinet meetings in a rage, and he too poured invectives upon General Debonair, a brave man under fire, but a lax disciplinarian, and launched his sarcasms against the venerable Admiral Vivier de Morin, whose ships went to the bottom without any apparent reason. Fortune La Personne listened open-eyed and grumbled scoffingly between his teeth. He is not satisfied with robbing Hippolyte Serre of his wife, but he must go and rob him of his catchwords, too. These storms were made known by the indiscretion of some ministers and by the complaints of the two old warriors, who declared their intention of flinging their portfolios at the beggar's head, but who did nothing of the sort. These outbursts, far from injuring the lucky Prime Minister, had an excellent effect on Parliament and public opinion, who looked on them as signs of a keen solicitude for the welfare of the National Army and Navy. The Prime Minister was the recipient of general approbation. To the congratulations of the various groups and of noble personages, he replied with simple firmness, Those are my principles, and he had seven or eight socialists put in prison. The session ended and Paul Visere, very exhausted, went to take the waters. Hippolyte Serret refused to leave his ministry, where the trade union of telephone girls was in tumultuous agitation. He opposed it with an unheard-of violence, for he had now become a woman-hater. On Sundays he went into the suburbs to fish, along with his colleague La Parson, wearing the tall hat that had never left him since he had become a minister. And both of them, forgetting the fish, complained of the inconstancy of women, and mingled their griefs. Hippolyta still loved Eveline, and he still suffered. However, hope had slipped into his heart. She was now separated from her lover, and thinking to win her back, he directed all his efforts to that end. He put forth all his skill, showed himself sincere, adaptable, affectionate, devoted, even discreet. His heart taught him the delicacies of feeling. He said charming and touching things to the faithless one, and to soften her he told her all that he had suffered. Crossing the band of his trousers upon his stomach, See, said he, how thin I have got. He promised her everything he thought could gratify a woman, country parties, hats, jewels. Sometimes he thought she would take pity on him. She no longer displayed an insolently happy countenance. Being separated from Paul, 
Her sadness had an air of gentleness, but the moment he made a gesture to recover her, she turned away fiercely and gloomily, girt with her fault as if with a golden girdle. He did not give up, making himself humble, suppliant, lamentable. One day he went to La Personne and said to him with tears in his eyes, Will you speak to her? La Personne excused himself, thinking that his intervention would be useless, but he gave some advice to his friend. Make her think that you don't care about her, that you love another, and she will come back to you. Hippolyta, adopting this method, inserted in the newspapers that he was always to be found in the company of Mademoiselle Guineau of the opera. He came home late, or did not come home at all, assumed in Eveline's presence an appearance of inward joy impossible to restrain, took out of his pocket at dinner a letter on scented paper, which he pretended to read with delight, and his lips seemed as in a dream to kiss invisible lips. Nothing happened. Eveline did not even notice the change. Insensible to all around her, she only came out of her lethargy to ask for some louis from her husband, and if he did not give them she threw him a look of contempt, ready to upbraid him with the shame which she poured upon him in the sight of the whole world. Since she had loved, she spent a great deal on dress. She needed money, and she had only her husband to secure it for her. She was so far faithful to him. He lost patience, became furious, and threatened her with his revolver. He said one day before her to Madame Clarence, I congratulate you, Madame. You have brought up your daughter to be a wanton hussy. Take me away, Mamma, exclaimed Eveline. I will get a divorce. He loved her more ardently than ever. In his jealous rage, suspecting her, not without probability, of sending and receiving letters, he swore that he would intercept them, re-established a censorship over the post, threw private correspondence into confusion, delayed stock exchange quotations, prevented assignations, brought about bankruptcies, thwarted passions and caused suicides. The independent press gave utterance to the complaints of the public and indignantly supported them. To justify these arbitrary measures, the ministerial journals spoke darkly of plots and public dangers and promoted a belief in a monarchical conspiracy. The less well-informed sheets gave more precise information, told of the seizure of fifty thousand guns and the landing of Prince Crucho. Feeling grew throughout the country, and the Republican organs called for the immediate meeting of Parliament. Paul Visere returned to Paris, summoned his colleagues, held an important cabinet council, and proclaimed through his agencies that a plot had actually formed against the national representation but that the Prime Minister held the threads of it in his hand, and that a judicial inquiry was about to be opened. He immediately ordered the arrest of thirty socialists, and whilst the entire country was acclaiming him as its saviour, baffling the watchfulness of his six hundred detectives, he secretly took Eveline to a little house near the northern railway station, where they remained until night. After their departure, the maid of their hotel, as she was putting their room in order, saw seven little crosses traced by a hairpin on the wall at the head of the bed. That is all that Hippolytus Array obtained as a reward of his efforts. End of Book 7, Chapter 8